Habermas here, and this is a bold thing for him to do, I want to point this out, in the, in the late 20th century, after all I told you that was going wrong, and after what looked like the destruction of reason itself in just, you know, in, in a society of subjects that have become kind of humanoids, it is quite a valiant thing to try to defend human reason, you know, in any form. And he does try to do so in, in this limited form. He wants to mark off a sphere of understarted communication that can serve as the basis for a concept of what he calls communicative rationality. Now, before we get into that argument, I want to explain why he does that, other than what I've already said, other than the reasons internal to his early work. He wants to do it to untangle the entwinement I talked about last time between enlightened thought and barbaric action that we've seen since the history of modernity. In other words, we've seen on the one hand people making these individually monological instrumental decisions based on instrumental reason leading to these horrible paradoxes and for Habermas the trick is not uh, to give up on modern life. It's not to fall beneath the level of civilization reached by capitalism. The trick is to disentangle enlightenment from terror, mythology, and barbarism. That, clearly, we haven't succeeded in doing in the 20th century. That's why I spent a lot of time in the first four lectures discussing, or some time discussing, uh, the experience of fascism and its effect on the earlier thinkers we talked about because fascism was the proof that enlightenment and technology had not led to the liberation of human beings as the great philosophers of the enlightenment thought it would. Instead, it had led to Dachau, and, so, and this was not its destination. And this was not what it, it, they, that, the destination that had been hoped for it. You know, the 19th century believed in progress, Adorno once cynically remarked, there is no history that leads from slavery to freedom, but there is a history that leads from the slingshot to the megaton bomb. So what Habermas wants to do is to try to find a, a way to disentangle the, the more uh, distarting, barbaric uh, aspects of enlightenment from those that we clearly want to hang on to. In Habermas's opinion, there have been advances in modern life, and I, I don't think anybody would dispute this. The advances in modern life include one this simple. It is much better to have a toothache in 1993 than in 1493. That's simple. Whenever anyone asks me about this, I go, well, there's one. I'd re in 1493, a toothache, if it's bad, you know, impacted, it's the end of your uh, theoretical work. It may be the end of your life. You get one now, you go to a dentist. That's, an, that's better. Not everything that's, that modernity has produced has been a disaster. Obviously. I mean, this is an obvious point. So the trick then is, as it were, to uh, 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 not throw out the baby with the bathwater, not throw out the advances of mod modernity, when we are in the process of trying to clear up this distorted communication forms and these distortions to people's ways of life. Okay, that's the trick. So there's a lot, a lot riding on his argument uh, concerning systematically distorted communication. Well, Habermas holds, and this is the rationalist thesis, this is the Enlightenment part, that the, that our, that the sentences that we utter, even from an early age, have, as it were, built into them the desire for consensus, for mutual understanding. That whether you consciously bring it to mind or not, when you speak a sentence, it has built into it, if you're following my argument, built into it the desire that you be understood by others. In other words, it has the critical impulse already built into it. That impulse that you communicate with that other person if they're from a different class, if they're uh, uh, from a different gender, 
You know, I mean, this is difficult. Men and women talking, different class, different race, different ethnic group. When you utter a sentence, Habermas says built into that utterance, into that communication, as one of its conditions is the desire for unconstrained understanding. Now you don't, when you say pass me the salt, bring to mind a desire for universal unconstrained understanding. But he thinks it is built into the structure of languages, the desire to understand one another, the desire to have clear communication. He begins to lay out a series of conditions which time will force me to just run through very quickly for such communication. One, and this of course is what I like to call the equality provision. Understarted communication would have a symmetry condition. Truly understarted communication would have a symmetry condition like this. Everyone would have an equal opportunity to talk and to listen. Everyone would have an equal opportunity to talk and to listen. Let me try to explain why this is more politically interesting than it sounds. It means everyone has an equal right to command as to obey. That's a speech act. That's a communicative act. It means everyone has an equal right to question and to an answer. This symmetry condition has more political power than it seems at first. It is a very egalitarian principle. Habermas believes that we couldn't have undistorted communication without it. Now, I'll give, again, he doesn't, but I'll try to give examples to make it understandable. I know as a teacher that it's an important condition, but it's impossible to achieve in a classroom under these current social conditions because I have the power to grade a child and give him an F and keep him out of law school, even if his rich daddy sends me 500 letters. Because I have that power, I can't expect that student and I to communicate in an undistorted way because our communication is distorted by my power to judge what the student says. This is why the people who run operations, bosses, seldom get the undistorted truth about their situation. I also think, being a husband, that it's why husbands seldom get the truth about the relationship they have with their wives, their sons, their daughters, and so on. Because when you're in a relative position of power, the other person's aware of it too and of their role, and you cannot expect an undistorted communication. One not. And I, again, don't mean personally, but systematically distorted. This is systematically distorted. It's distorted by relations of unequal power. In a, if, if you're to be communicative, ra communicatively rational, everyone has to have the same right to speak and be heard. I also need to give you a real-world example of that. And that would be something like the great early meetings of solidarity. I mean, Lech Walesa recognized people, but anybody could stick their hand up, union member or not. That was when... They had crossed the line into a total revolution. And Lech Walesa, uh, sure, he was recognizing people, but everyone had a right to do that. And it wasn't always him either, even though that was what was presented in our media. And that is, while not perfect, and we're not expecting the world ever to be perfect, neither is Habermas, this is a model of communication that is what you would call dialogic. You're dialoguing now. You're not monologuing. You may notice that this is based on a quite ancient idea. It's a Socratic ideal. When Socrates argues with an interlocutor, he never pulls the argument that, well, I'm more powerful than you, so you're wrong. As a matter of fact, one of the charms of Socrates is that he owns almost nothing and has almost no position. And the only force he expects you to recognize is the force that Habermas says is the only force a free human being can ever recognize. And that is that peculiar, strange, unforced force of the better argument. 